Rajiv Kakkar is a seasoned banker, a serial business founder, an entrepreneur, public speaker and thought leader with over three decades of experience in financial services across various countries and geographies. During his career, Rajiv Kakkar has operated large banks and financial institutions, successfully realigned banking businesses, executed multi-country business strategies, led acquisitions and transformations. He continues to actively serve on several prominent boards of global leading banks and won many international awards. Let's have a quick chat with Rajiv Kaka. How do you see recovering global economy from COVID-19 shock and when do you think economy will be fully recovered? It is important to remember that this time around while the pandemic has triggered the start of the economic contraction, the issue has been further exacerbated by the tremendous actions taken by governments worldwide in terms of announcing lockdowns. Now lockdowns have led to a shutdown of complete economic activity and that has obviously had an impact on contracting the economy. In addition to this, in the absence of a vaccine being found, people are obviously concerned and scared. And when human beings are scared, there's obviously going to be a fear in consumption, fear of going out and spending, fear of traveling, and all of these have a negative multiplier effect on the economy. So as we go forward, this is obviously going to only be reversed when the lockdowns are reversed, because that's going to be the first spur of positive economic uh, action. But even a positive economic action of that size cannot lead to reversal of economic growth back to the original levels. Because the people's assurance of being able to go out and still spend comfortably and be able to restore their normal habits is going to take much longer to happen. Now obviously with such an extended period of contraction, the ability of businesses to be able to hire, create employments, pay their people or even be able to invest is going to be adversely impacted. And that is going to impact a lot of people and the economy in general in terms of consumption. So even as we see the vaccine being found, and while it takes a while to administer, I think it'll take far longer for the entire ability of the institutions to be able to go back, businesses to be able to hire, businesses to be able to invest in the economy to be able to grow. So if you really ask me when we will see the global economy grow, and I'm talking about economy and not financial markets, uh, I think it will take, assuming we find a vaccine in about the middle of 2021, I think it will take 18 to 24 months after that for the confidence to grow and thereafter two to three years for it to build. So the closest I can think of is end 2025 when the economy will be fully restored. Do you think that we should be ready for a great recession in the wake of huge economic losses and job cuts on account of the pandemic? I personally don't think we will see a repeat of the great financial recession that we saw in 2008 or what we saw in 1929. Uh, this is a different situation. The governments this time globally, central banks, governments have all reacted so fast and have played the government playbook on releasing financial and fiscal as well as monetary stimulus at great speed, learning from the experiences of the past to make sure that credit markets, financial markets, equity markets and debt markets do not fail. Uh, learning from the past, in the last two big major crises, we have seen that banks have led to a large failure in the system which has led to a complete sloppage of economic activity, which has been a major cause for concern around the world in terms of uh, the havoc it has caused. This time round, banks have actually been constructive participants of the process. Banks are far better capitalized. Regulators have ensured that banks are uh, capitalized for all kinds of down downsides. They're far more liquid, capital levels are adequate, and the ability to sit back and still be able to provide a responsible credit to those who are deserving and to make sure obligos that need this money are being provided support is very high. Governments, in fact, are using them very actively as uh, transmission mechanisms to be able to pass on the stimulus that is being provided by the government or the helicopter money that is being given to smaller businesses or as, as well to the individuals who are impacted by a pandemic. And obviously, this kind of a process has ensured that individuals and small businesses, which are a very constructive part of the economic process, continue to function. While it is true that these actions can be criticized in some ways for leading to supporting uh, some of the zombie companies uh, getting supported and you know continuing to function, which is 
perhaps not by, seen by many to be fair. Therefore, given the constructive role of the banks, as well as the constructive role that the governments have placed and central banks have responsibly managed, and the aligned actions of central banks and governments around the world, it is highly doubtful that we should see a repeat of the recession that we saw in the past. Dubai is quick to reopen its economy and looks set to gain momentum for business activities and tourism. What do you have to say? I believe uh, Dubai and the UAE have handled the pandemic situation extremely well. In fact, it is at this time that we've seen that the speed at which the lockdowns were announced, the effectiveness of the lockdowns, uh, the communication levels that were ensured at every point of time, the availability of services through digital means, making sure that adequate groceries and essential supplies were always available to people, and uh, at the same time, ensuring that banks would come forward and offer very uh, helpful moratoria to people who had obligations to banks. So, effectively, a combination of measures, sterilization, and a bunch of other healthcare support activities have ensured that people have had the ability to maintain a high level of confidence that they could be safe here and at the same time most of the essential needs would be well provided for. In such a situation, obviously, the UAE and Dubai are well positioned to be winners. Uh, there has been a, a, a very careful and a selective process of even opening up the economy as it has been done in a very uh, stable fashion. It's been done with a lot of communication announcing all kinds of controls and measures and making sure that people understand that a large part of the responsibility lies not just with the government but also lies with each one of us. There have been additional support also provided to small businesses to make sure people could extend their visas and remain in the country even if they didn't have their employment. For small businesses to be able to keep their people in employment and be able to manage their costs down. Uh, so these softer measures, both in terms of communication, both in terms of policy actions as well as financial measures, have led to a tremendous amount of business confidence growing and has led to uh, the ability for the businesses as well as the economy to spring back as soon as things start getting back into normal. Overall, uh, it is fair to assume that like the rest of the world, given that a lot of people have uh, lost their earnings, a lot of people have lost some of their wealth, some people have lost their jobs, and there has been some kind of exodus where people have had to go back to their home countries, there is bound to be a negative impact uh, on the economy. But needless to say, uh, new kinds of jobs are going to emerge. The infrastructure in Dubai and the UAE is world class. People today accept it as a place to live in. And we will perhaps, if we start looking uh, later at the list of winners and losers, we can see Dubai as a global destination to be able to attract far more people coming in and be able to benefit from the great infrastructure and benefit from the opportunities around locally as well as in the region around. How do you evaluate the role of banks in present scenario to bring economic stability? Like the rest of the world, the UAE is no different and it is fair to expect that we shall see far greater levels of consolidation and banking, mergers and acquisitions happening because the world doesn't really need so many banks. Uh, not because banking is not needed, but because of the evolution of new technology and changes which have made it necessary for the operating models of banks to change. Uh, banks need to necessarily uh, consolidate for a combination of reasons. One of them, of course, is to be able to make sure that they can be greater economies of scales and efficiencies, which are very important. And banks need to become large repositories of assets, liabilities, and uh, at the same time create a massive ability to to process transactions and build superior capability while ensuring a high level of reliability and security to people. Given the fiduciary responsibilities and the governance levels expected from banks, this is very important. Having too many banks in any country is always a challenge for the supervision process, for regulators to be able to provide effective supervision, and that too is a very strong determinant in ensuring that there needs to be far bigger banks, uh, far more consolidation to be able to make sure they can be economies of scale and economies of uh, oversight to be able to make sure that the process is more effective. However, this has not just been made possible because of these factors. This has also been made, fact, uh, made possible because of massive changes in the evolution of technology. New age technology, open banking, change in regulations around API-led banking have today made it possible for there to be a far better ability for banks to partner with uh, fintechs, with new age technology providers, to be able to tie in with platforms, be a part of marketplaces lead to an automation of the journey and make sure that the customer journey can be far better digitalized and be able to provide in an effective way so that the customer can benefit and get the true value. 
So going forward, we will see very sta safe, stable, large, big banks that will process the assets, liabilities, and be able to provide the reliability and security, partnering with very innovative solutions, which are going to be new age, which will be linked to the customer journey, which will even lead to the abstraction of embeddedness and embeddedness of finance into the customer journeys of third-party players and platforms so that people can avail of finance and its options on the front end on a direct basis without necessarily going to the bank. It's interesting, this time around, if you evaluate the roles of banks uh, to the economy, I think globally banks have been the constructive partners and for once not the contributors to the crisis. Uh, not only are they adequately capitalized, not only are they ac adequately liquid and well-funded, but they've also been very proactive uh, in partnering with governments in making sure that they could be active transmitters and a, a channel to be able to provide some of the transmission to the economy and ensuring that it is passed through responsible means to get the maximum traction to the economy uh, through some of these measures that have been in initiated by the governments. To have a healthy banking system is imperative. Both the earlier major crises in the world uh, in 1929 as well as in 2008 have shown that banking collapsing can lead to significant contagion risks. It can lead to an absolute loss of confidence. It can lead to freezing of economic activity. And this time around, we have not seen this. So all I can say is that both regulators, governments uh, need to be applauded because governments and regulators have ensured in the last 10 to 12 years uh, in playing a very constructive part in regulating banks better in ensuring far more stringent requirements in terms of capital and funding, in terms of governance and reporting, in terms of the kind of measures and the financial market infrastructure that has been developed and in, in ensuring that they could be more efficient uh, provision of services. So I am very hopeful and very positive about the role of banks in this crisis and we should see far more benefits coming as soon as the economy starts coming back into positive levels again. How do you see future of banking in the wake of automation and digitization? And do you see the role of physical bank branches in coming years? Do you see consolidation and mergers in the UAE banking sector in the near future? I believe the future of banking is going to be extremely exciting. There's going to be a lot more innovation happening, a lot more creativity and a leverage of a process of con convergent destruction that has been taking place in the, in the world over the last few years. There is a massive influx of new technology. There's mobility options coming in, cloud, analytics, data-driven solutions. And uh, the best part is all players in the, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem are all participating in this process. So obviously, together with the supervision pressure that has become very high and the need to for fiduciary responsibilities, banks are going to start getting unbundled. The traditional bank always likes to be the sole provider through clunky infrastructure to be able to provide for all the needs of uh, a customer through use of technology. Today, that model is completely changing. It will start getting unbundled. We will see a lot more partnering happening, not just manufacturing of services themselves, but certain products are going to be manufactured themselves. Asset liability management, treasury management, capital management, and also providing the reliability, security, safety, and the governance will be a main part of the bank. But when it comes to the customer journey and providing customer centricity and relevance, there is going to be far more openness around partnering. Operating models are going to be, become agile. There will be a process by which uh, there will be digitization of a lot more of the customer journeys. Automation will be used uh, uh, together with robotics, artificial intelligence to be able to make intelligent decisions so that decisions can be real time and quick. And at the same time, banks are essentially going to embed their products and services into the larger uh, marketplace and then activate through data the platforms and be able to make sure that push and pull processes happen and they lead out to people. So we're talking about a lot more innovation, we're talking about a lot more creativity, we're talking about ensuring that finance, which is very essential uh, to any kind of commerce or any kind of good flow, is going to become a core component and be integrated into the journeys that people handle. And predictive analytics, making sure that everything comes in through a unified relationship, through a single relationship, allowing people to get both first proprietary products from banks as well as third-party banks will become core to ensuring that the lives of people can be better and businesses can be better served for their growth and expansion. Being a veteran in banking industry, what three tips will you give to young bankers? On the tips to budding uh, bankers, my advice is going to be consistent with what I've been saying over the years. 
Um, well, the first is please be always open to knowledge, open to gaining knowledge and learning because over my three decades plus of uh, banking experience, so much has changed. And the only thing that I've always benefited from is to ensure that I keep learning. Uh, there's nothing you can learn today, uh, however much and however well you do, that will serve you well for the next 30, 40 years of your life. Things change so fast, so you have to be constantly in a learning mode and you have to be open to gaining new knowledge. The second thing I would say is disruption, which is today a buzzword, is going to become a way of life. Was disruption a buzzword only in the current years? I don't think so. We've always seen disruption even in the 80s and the 90s when I was working in my early days. And it has been no difference. It's just that the kind of disruption has been different. And the only way to manage it is to make sure, and this is my advice, please always focus on creativity and innovation. It is not solutions and products that will disrupt the status quo. It is going to be your levels of creativity and innovation, leveraging the knowledge that I told you earlier about to be able to use your smart ability and intellectual capacity to be able to disrupt the status quo. The third advice is very high levels of ethics and integrity. It is extremely important as a banker to be very high on integrity and uh, moral standards, to be able to ensure that you deliver the high level of ethical uh, practices, be fair to customers, be fair to sh shareholders, be fair to stakeholders, be fair to the community. Because going forward, uh, there is going to be a lot more governance premium on people who, or institutions who provide the right fiduciary responsibilities and provide the highest levels of governance. So those are my three elements of uh, advice. And if you can do that, I assure you, you'll be the best bankers in the world. Are you ready to explore banking sector for another venture? If yes, uh, we request you to share some details. That's an interesting question. I have been uh, a banker for 33 years plus and an entrepreneur at heart. And having worked in multiple countries, having worked in one of the finest banks for the first 20 years of my life and thereafter spending the next decade and a half uh, creating a global group of banking uh, organizations, uh, has been uh, a tremendous journey and obviously this has led to great learning in terms of banking and financial skills but also learning in terms of how institutions are created, banks are created, financial and other institutions are, uh, are, are grown. My uh, belief is I will definitely do something more exciting. Some of the events have already started, some of my initiatives have started. And uh, being an entrepreneur at heart, I would like to leverage my learning, my experiences, and also leverage the tremendous amount of growth in technology and opportunities which are now becoming borderless uh, and are becoming very relevant to people at all levels of the economic spectrum, the socio-economic spectrum. I think the opportunity is going to be great. Neo banks and uh, neo banking is an area that is of huge interest to me as we see greater cost commoditization, greater need for customer centricity, uh, greater platformification, use of data for decision making, uh, cost efficiencies and the pressure on banks uh, because of uh, dropping interest rates and delivering profitability. I think the real value add in banking is now going to come in uh, on the asset light side of neo banking, And that's an area where uh, I intend to do a lot more, apart from of course using my years of uh, experience in uh, supporting other well stable good banks and uh, whether it's through board roles, whether it's through senior roles, oversight, etc., as well as the startups on the other side to be able to drive and leverage innovation. So yes, there will be a lot more and uh, I continue to, to work on those. I'll also request you to share some details about your contributions to education sector, nurturing talents and skills of young entrepreneurs. Apart from banking and financial services and, and creating institutions or turning around institutions, one of my biggest passions, my biggest focus is on education. Not so much as a business, but more because I believe this is probably one of the best ways to be able to contribute back to society and also be able to make the best impact. We are all beneficiaries of uh, excellent education. To be honest, I'm grateful for all the education that I received, whether it was through my college, university, or even through my institutions where I've worked. And it is that learning, it is that process of education that has made it possible for people like me to be able to contribute, to be able to benefit from the opportunities that the world provides. So it is because of this that in all my ventures, in all the businesses I've run, I've always focused on making sure that I would run very strong internal as well as external processes of making sure that there's a constant process of learning, recreating and reinvention of skills for people who work with me. 
I've consciously sent lots and lots of people to leading schools around the world, helping them become parts of networks that will help them for life. And at the same time, even within my own uh, businesses I set up, for instance, the last institution I set up in the UA, uh, which is Dunia, I ensured that there was a young business leader program where, where I used and leveraged that pro pro program to make sure that there could be constant learning for young uh, school-going students and early college-going students so that there could be an element of awareness built in them pretty early and, and hopefully ignite a spark that would help them grow in a positive manner. Finally, all I can say is that it is very important for each one of us to be able to contribute to education because unfortunately it's becoming a process of entitlement. We must realize that there are millions and millions of people who are very bright and probably brighter than some of those who are entitled who sometimes never get an opportunity to contribute to society. If we can help democratize education, if we can make sure that each one of those entrepreneurs, each one of those bright people, who are perhaps not as entitled in terms of assets and ownership of financial resources to be able to study themselves, could be given this opportunity, the impact of the world would be tremendous. And it is for this reason that education will always be a prime focus area for me and my efforts. What do you advise students about selection of careers as some professions may not, you know, uh, exist in coming years? My advice to young students is very simple. The first advice I would give you is definitely don't listen to your parents. I know a lot of parents will be very unhappy to hear that, but I, I believe that none of us uh, really know what's, what the future is like and our children are far better positioned to be able to do that. So we should step aside and children should really form their decisions based on people who are their peers, from what they see going forward, and obviously benefit from some of the learning that the parents provide. But don't just be guided by the past because the past is definitely not an indicator of the future. The second advice is please go out and dare to do what you love to do. Do not go for stable, established, erstwhile professions. Do not try to just be something because it is considered fashionable or good to be. Remember, the world today offers opportunities that didn't exist in our time. And you can be good at whatever you do. And there are opportunities for uh, innovation, for entrepreneurship, for making a change uh, with mobility, with partnering, with leveraging so much which is exists in today's world. So go out and dare what you want to do. Have the courage, the grit, the resolve to be able to achieve what is really within your heart. Because that is what you will excel in, not following something that has been laid out for you by something, somebody else. A third advice which I must add is uh, please ensure that at any point of time learn how to you walk the talk. A lot of people just talk the talk and they don't end up executing. However good you may be, however good your planning may be, if you don't execute against it, it will not lead to success. So please learn to always focus on walking the talk. As far as the careers in the future, I would be doing you an absolute disservice suggesting what careers to follow. Because I frankly don't know and knowing how the world has changed, I think nobody should be guided by the past and nobody should try to hazard a guess. The only thing you should do is, I can talk about three essential skills and attributes that you must develop because that will prepare you for any of the careers that come up, any of the opportunities that come up because the world ahead is going to be far more exciting than what you can even imagine before. Definitely build very strong cognitive skills. If there is an intelligence system in the world, it's the human brain. And if, you, if we can somehow develop very strong cognitive skills to be able to understand and replicate some of that intelligent uh, system working, then it'll help us leverage a lot of the capabilities and the opportunities in the future. Secondly, learn to be data and analytics driven. In this world of data and the kind of footprint everyone leaves, the digital footprint, it's extremely important that we must understand how to leverage it and must understand how we can make data driven and analytics driven decision making. Lastly, do not ever hesitate to fail. And I mean this well, because we need to learn not just how to survive, we need to learn how to thrive. And that can only come if we build skills that help us adapt, if we build skills that help us go out and experiment, which give us the confidence to go out and do things, and, and do it in a manner such that it's safe to fail. Because unless you fail, you will not learn how to better do things. So almost every entrepreneur, every person who has been a lot uh, successful in this world, who has achieved great things, has always experienced failure several times before the success has happened. So go out, build not just for resilience, build for adaptability, and make sure that you're ready for the future opportunities. Make sure that you are future ready, future fit, and always ready to achieve the best opportunities and realize them in the future.